kind of excited today. We're going to be talking to these guys about the about uh, the migratory patterns of birds. Something I don't oh. know anything about. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's the Kirkland warbler, um, which is you know this species. And I might have a question. I have another warbler that I'm interested in. But yeah, I think it'll be. I'm curious to see what we're going to find out. Yeah. Okay. See you on there. Welcome everybody. We have uh, Nathan and Pete with us, and we're very excited to have them um, talk about some incredible things around birds, migratory patterns, and things that I don't know anything about, but excited to, to find out. So thank you for joining. Yeah. So how did you guys start? How did you, well, how did you, were you both bird watchers before you started to study birds? Uh, I was. I was. I was very interested in nature from a very young age. At like six years old, I was just like I think a lot of us in our fields. We were exposed to nature and birds and outdoors, and and uh, had an up close and personal experience with a with a bird, a chickadee, at a local nature center. And where nature. Sorry, but where was that? Where, I was where? in uh, Norwalk, Connecticut. Nature centers are often sort of the gateway drug to, you know, deeper understanding and deeper excitement about birds or salamanders or other things. They're, they're definitely the, the other form of a library in a community. Right. And, and Nathan, was it the same kind of experience for you? A little bit different, I guess. My, um, both my parents were uh, public school science teachers. And so sort of grew up around science and, and animals and was interested generally, but I didn't really develop my love and, and passion for birds until I was in college and started actually doing some field work and some research with birds. And that, that was when I knew, you know, I wanted to work with birds for the rest of my life. Um, up until then, I just kind of had a, a lot of interest in nature and, and spending a time outside and, and general appreciation for science. And how did it narrow to warblers or did it, did, am I pronouncing that correctly? And, and did yeah. that, how did you guys get interested in that particular bird? So it's a, it's a large group of birds. And for me, it was basically, that's what I started studying. That was kind of where I got my first job. And so that's what I became familiar with. And, and for me, it's sort of easiest to think about and develop interesting questions with what you're most familiar with. And so I've really focused on these smaller warblers and other songbirds, um, whereas Pete's worked on a lot of different types of birds. Um, and and you know, it, 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 when you're when you first go and you're going to study a bird, right? Is it different than than you would like? Like, what does that mean? Does that mean you go into the into the you know the woods and you and you you observe the bird? So it often starts with that. I mean, it often starts with a basic, you know, uh, curious question. You know, why is the bird doing that? Why is that bird here? Where did it come from? What is the bird eating? Why are there no birds here anymore? You know, it's, it's, it's all about curiosity and being able to sort of then ask a question and then make that question a little bit more sophisticated to put it into a scientific hypothesis and then come up with tests or experiments to test that idea. And, you know, I, I'm embarrassed to say, uh, or to, to, to count the number of years that I put into school to be able to put it into hypothesis and experimental framework to where we are now. But lots of schoolwork is, and then both Nate, Nate and I can talk about that uh, has gone into developing our ability to take that simple observation and put it into an experimental framework so we can then answer the question. Are you asking the question about the birds themselves? Or are you looking at the birds as a gateway to understanding the rest of our planet, our systems? You know, like, is it the love of the bird or is it the bird's relationship to our, to us and earth? So yes, yes, and yes. And that is a very, very good question um, because there definitely are some people, some scientists that are more interested in the question and then there are others that are more interested in the animal. And I think, you know, from my perspective, I bleed feathers. I love birds. I really enjoy, you know, when I'm watching a bird, I'm in my happy place. But I also am driven by the questions. And birds, like no other animal, are bioindicators. They're ecological indicators of the health of the planet. And so to the point that you just made, I do it because I also care about the future of our planet. And and you know what we're going to leave future generations and so birds to me 
tell us a lot about how we're doing there. How are we doing? <laughs> Not so good. <laughs> um, Not so good at uh, all. Now, now, in a sense, you know, we're all familiar with birds, you know, <clears throat> they're all around us all the time, but we, we actually don't, like, they, they fly. So they, they, they have a whole uh, world unto which that we, the, the, me as a, not knowing anything about, I just don't know very much about. So how do you, how do you, you know, are you just seeing a little piece of the bird? It's like studying a fish. How can you know all the things a fish is doing or a bird is doing? I think that's been something that, that particularly Pete and I have been working to overcome because I think you're quite right that for decades and decades of studying birds, we've often focused on one little part of its life cycle. What is it doing when it's nesting? But they only spend a couple months of the year nesting and especially these migratory birds, they're moving often thousands of miles away to spend you know time in other countries and, and moving across political borders and so their life cycles are actually quite complicated and that makes studying them both more interesting but also also more challenging and a lot of our research is focused on showing that you really have to consider this full annual life cycle um, to fully understand what's going on more than annual because in this latest study that that i read you you, um, there's some indications that the bird is actually thinking about where it's going to be next year, right? Like it's, it's, Absolutely. it's, you know, it has a, it has a whole life, uh, you know, much more, it seems much more complicated than I would think of just how a bird thinks. Indeed. Yeah. So we, we're often sort of focused on this full annual cycle, but the place that we would really like to get is kind of looking across the whole lifespan of individual birds. Um, often the technology isn't, doesn't really allow us to do that right now, but it's definitely where we would like to, to head, I think. Now, tell us about this, this most recent study you did, because it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Sure, so the basic idea is that we, we had set up a study in which we were going down to the Bahamas and putting these little radio tags on a species of bird called the Curtains Warbler. And that's where they spend the winter. And then using these kind of automated radio towers um, that can detect these birds as they fly past them, we're able to basically tell when the birds leave the Bahamas and pick up little hints about where they're going during migration. But the really cool thing is that we can then find these exact same individuals on the breeding grounds in Michigan, thousands of miles away. And so we had had this study planned and I was getting ready to give a talk on this um, topic and began to create some animations of the movement data. And I saw what I first noticed was that during the breeding season when birds should be basically not moving around at all, they're sort of hanging around within a few hundred meters of their nest for the whole season, we saw some really big movements. And I initially assumed that it was some kind of error in the code that I was running or something like that. But after, you know, really pouring over the data, we saw that these movements were real. So some individuals were moving five, 10, 50 kilometers or more away from where they had originally settled on the breeding grounds. And that movement at that scale was really um, unprecedented in, in other birds. Um, and so well, that sort of led us into this year long rabbit hole of, um, of looking at these movements and trying to understand what they mean. It, is it unprecedented for other birds or do we just not have enough information to know if it's, if it's, you know? That's a, that's a great question. And so our, our conclusion is essentially that these movements are probably really common in other species. We have some, because Kirtland's warblers have such limited areas in which they breed, we can kind of cover the whole breeding grounds uh, logistically well. And other people, other researchers just don't have that um, ability. And so we're likely just picking up movements that are happening in other species. It just, the, it just so happens that we have the ability to pick them up. So there are any environmental indicators so that when they moved from where we thought they were going to be, what did you study, you know, around to kind of maybe get an insight as to why they decided to move? So, uh, in some respects, we don't really know. What, what we do know is that they're moving from one isolated patch of breeding habitat, 50 or 60 kilometers to another isolated breeding patch. So 
they're really specialized on that jack pine habitat and they're moving from patch to patch. Um, we think that they're moving. Sorry, because go they, ahead. they like that tree or they, they're, they're used to that tree. Exactly. So they basically will only nest in very young jack pine forests. And that's their, they're very specialized on that breeding habitat. Other species of birds will use a variety of different habitats, but Kirtland's warblers are really focused on that one, that one type of habitat. Now, will they, when, how do they know where this other habitat was? That's a great question. And, and quite honestly, we, we don't know the answer. Um, many of these birds were young birds. They uh, didn't have a lot of opportunities to have previously been to these other sites. So they sort of knew where they were from past experience. Mm -hmm. um, so ultimately we, you know, we're not, we're not really sure. And that's uh, certainly a question we'd be interested in trying to look at in the future. How long did it take them to go? Like, first of all, why would they leave the Bahamas? But I, I don't know, maybe it was a rainy sun. <laughs> Such a great place to be. But sure. um, why, how long does it take them to get to Michigan? And like, do they stop or are they flying through storms? You know, like how fast? I mean, it's- Sure. Yeah, they, on average, they take about two weeks um, to make the, the complete migration. They can do it in as little as about, you know, eight or nine days. Some take three weeks. So there's a lot of variation. Um, as far as we know, they basically, they, so they migrate during the night and they stop each day to rest and refuel. Now, in some cases, they'll stop for a few days and really rest and, and build up those fat reserves and then make another, another push. Um, other times they'll move each night. And so it, it, it varies to some extent between birds. Um, did they, uh, when, when, so you see these patterns, did you already know that they were in the Bahamas? Did you already yeah. know where roughly they were? Exactly, so, yeah, we did. So their, their wintering grounds were discovered in the late 1800s. Hmm. So we sort of knew where they bred and where they wintered, um, but we didn't know much about sort of how they got from one place to the other, what sort of paths they took. and. Uh, things like that. Now, do you guys go to the Bahamas to check it out and walk around and, and be in the woods there and feel like what that is like in the other place? Definitely. Yeah. So we spend a couple months, most years down on the wintering grounds, sort of tagging these birds and, and trying to think about what their winter habitat looks like and why one area might be better than another. A lot, a lot of the work that we do, we have a lots of other studies going on in the Caribbean more broadly and in Central America, in Belize, and we've been working in South America. And this is where these birds, these migratory birds, and 75% of the species in the US and Canada are actually migratory. Not all of them go to the tropics, but many go on these journeys throughout their annual cycle. And a lot of the work that we do is studying these birds in the tropics during our winters but it's where it's still warm. There's lots of food over winter, but it's understanding how these birds are doing and how things that happen to them in the winter in places like the Bahamas or Jamaica or Belize influence their, their condition, their timing and their survival back up on breeding grounds. And this is, this is what we're sort of looking at, something called a seasonal interaction, how things in, the, in Jamaica might influence the success of birds back in the US. And it turns out it's quite important. Are they eating different things, you know, so when they're in the, what's the kind of food source? What's the totally. difference? Yeah, I mean, when they're in the tropics, the, the insects there are very different than the insects, completely different than the insects that they might eat back up at the breeding grounds. On the breeding grounds, when they're feeding their young, they're eating a lot of caterpillar, uh, caterpillars, insect larvae, really rich in protein and nutrients. On the uh, non-breeding grounds in the winter, they're eating a lot of flies and a variety of other things. Kirtlands will eat fruit. Uh, other species that we study eat entirely insects. Why wouldn't they go and find like, like, you know, a similar climate? Like, why wouldn't they go to the south? Like, they go to Michigan, or are they go to Michigan when it's hot. You know what I mean? Well, Kirtlands warblers, you know, they're going further north to to Kirtland. They leave the Bahamas in part because things are changing in the Bahamas. And that they need to breed in order to sustain their species. So they can't do that in places like the Bahamas and feed themselves as well as a brood of three to four young. And so in order to compensate for that, they've got to fly north. And we're a place where there's going to be this big flush of insects in our summer. And so there the conditions are better. The days are longer. They can feed their young for more time throughout the day. And so they can produce more young. But then things change in Michigan 
And so they fly south again. So they're in some ways in search of the constant summer. Mm. And, ah. and for Kirtland's warblers in particular, Michigan is the furthest south that you'll find jack pine trees. And so they're basically going the shortest distance to get to that type of breeding habitat. Um, it's thought, although not you know, known entirely, that during the last time when there were glaciers, Kirtlands were probably breeding in Georgia or south of the Appalachian Mountains, but the, the um, range of jack pines slowly moved north with the glaciers. And so that migration over many thousands of years got longer and longer um, each year. And there's no jack pines between the two places? No, exactly. Right. Um, you know, you said that some things that might happen in the Bahamas might affect things that happen in Michigan. What were some of those causal things that you found? So for not just for Kirtland's warblers, but for other species, you know, we've all heard of La Ninas and El Ninos, and these are years that are sometimes really wet or sometimes really dry. And when that happens, that changes the conditions of these habitats. So in some winters when the, uh, it's really dry, that influences the condition of the birds or when they may depart on spring migration. And that influences when they arrive and the condition they're in when they arrive, or it might even influence the number of individual animals that survive the winter. And it might mean that more males survive than more females. And that changes something called the sex ratio. Um, and that, inf that has real significant consequences on how many young are produced back up on the breeding grounds. So we've shown with various species uh, in various places that what happens in the tropics is inextricably linked to what happens back up in places like Michigan. So this is really, really, and that includes habitat loss due to things like the development of hotels or human encroachment for various reasons. Um, so, you know, we need to start thinking about how we do conservation much more broadly than just within the United States. If we hope to protect species like the Kirtland's warblers or any species that migrate beyond our borders throughout their annual cycle. And that's a lot of species. Do we no. know how old they are, the species? You know, like how long this particular bird has been around? Thousands of years. I, we don't know specifically, I don't know how, how deep its phylogeny is, but it's been around for thousands of years for sure. And it's taken that amount of time for it to sort of become more specialized on something like a jack pine habitat. And this is true for a lot of these species. I think warblers in general are thought to be young species, but in each of these cases, you know, the, the Kirtlands is thought to be pretty specialized with respect to jack pine, but most of these species are actually specialized. And the more we tweak these systems or reduce the habitat, the more we make it difficult for these species to adapt and respond because we're doing it in time frames that they didn't evolve in. And so it's a really challenging situation that we're in. You know, um, with I've seen with certain butterfly uh, species, they just will nest in one plant. And so right. people start growing that plant. Uh, and it seems like it's maybe been effective in that kind of thing. Do we, should we be planting more of this tree? Well, that's a really good point. Nate, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. So that, that's exactly how this species recovered. So at one point in its, in, in the past, when the, in 1974 and 1987, again, there were only 167 male Kirtland's warblers left anywhere in the world. Um, and the species was really critically endangered. Um, in fact, it was one of the first species on the endangered species list back in 1966. And the, probably the main factor that has led to their really remarkable recovery to more than 2,500 males today was the fact that the uh, US Forest Service and Michigan DNR created a lot of new habitat. So they went out and they planted lots and lots of jack pine trees all over northern Michigan and birds pretty quickly moved into those habitats and started breeding them then, breeding in them and we saw the numbers increase. So in some cases that's exactly what is is required. Does but if I could just add on to that a little bit because your your point was a really important one for other species too. Um, and we can go out there and plant milkweeds to raise monarch butterflies. And whether that really is influencing the numbers or not is, is, is unclear. But in general, in urban and suburban areas, we've changed the proportion of native versus non-native plants significantly. 
And when you do that, because there's so many insects, most insects are really tightly evolved with their pl host plants. And when we put a ginkgo in and take out a cherry, we're reducing the overall number of insects that form this underlying food web that everything else above it, like birds, depends on. So we're changing the structure of these communities and we've changed the structure of these communities in really disturbing ways. So in fact, if people wanna plant plants to bring back birds, they can do that by planting native species in their yards and it can make a real big difference. You know, um, we see, um, uh, we were just on a call Reese, earlier today talking about um, the sort of change that's gonna have to happen in, in in terms of environment, you know, talking about climate. And isn't this another area where there has to be a, a sort of, a, you know, a psychological change, a, a feeling about nature and our balance in nature uh, as we urbanize these areas and as we change these areas where we're destroying a lot of the diversity that we will, will need as a, as a species, yeah? There's no question. Um, we have to really, articulate at, to school age kids why nature matters, why birds matter, why something like the Kirtland warbler matters, why diversity matters. And part of that challenge is not only going to be to teach it in schools, but it's going to be to diversify our approach to this. So it's not just to white America, but it's to Hispanics, it's to blacks, it's to men and women. We're, we need to diversify our audience so it represents the true representation that's out there if we ultimately are going to be successful at this. It's got to be in urban areas. It's got to be in rural areas. This is, a, this is the, one of the biggest battles we face, I think, in the coming decade. And why, and to ask that question, you know, to a child, right, to young kids, you grew up with the nature center, why do birds matter? Why is it important? You know, birds themselves, you know, other species, what, what is the importance of the bird? So there's, there's several answers to that question. The first one of which is birds provide really important ecosystem services, things like pollination, seed dispersal, pest control. These are all things that create healthy environments, environments that humans are inextricably linked to, part of. There's that answer. But there's also the other answer, which is that just like art, just like music, there may not be a specific value that we can account for um, to, to put on a bird. It's hard to put a dollar sign on a bird. It's hard to put a, a dollar sign on a piece of priceless art. But it's priceless because it, present, it gives us something as a society, as, as, as it's something uh, about, our, about our future, that we all depend on this thing, that we appreciate this thing. And I, I think we have to start thinking about birds in the same way we think of priceless art that it's something that we have to sort of save and conserve and preserve for future generations. Beauty of the musicality, for example, for people who really have never heard birds sing, you know, when you talk about art, do you, do you, do you listen to birds? Like, are you must be very astute at how you kind of listen and distinguish different bird calls and how do we get people acclimated and think and, and listening, like really listening to birds? Well, it's, it's funny because when I take groups out bird watching or take people out into, into nature, whether it's bird watching or whatever, most people are not necessarily attuned to the soundscape. And, you know, when I'm lying in bed in April or depending upon where you are in the springtime, when you go from, when you transition from winter to, to spring, it's amazing how that soundscape really changes as birds start to sing. And it doesn't matter where you are. Birds provide that touchstone to nature like, like no other animal because you can hear them inside your house. And once you go outside, you don't need to see them. You can hear them, whether they're singing this incredible breeding song or they're chipping just a, a single note. You hear them more than any other animal. Um, or you see them and they have these incredible colors. So they touch upon many different senses that we all have, whether it's hearing or seeing. Uh, and so I think they provide this incredible avenue for getting people excited about nature. Do you, do you see the same birds when you go to Bermuda? Do you, or you, you know, like when you're down there and, and the birds come in or when you're, where you know they're gonna be there, do you see the same birds you see in Michigan? This, like the same exact individuals or just yeah, the same species? The same, 
the same, well, you said before you could track an individual. So do you see the same ones? We do, yeah. Uh, quite often um, we'll, you know, be out in the field in the Bahamas and we'll see a bird. And the way that we sort of identify individuals is we put these little tiny plastic uh, bracelets on their feet and we put them in a specific combination. So we will know, okay, this bird's red, blue, aluminum, green, or whatever. And we can say, you know, we can look up the history of that bird and say, oh, we saw that bird two years ago in Michigan and it had this reproductive success, um, et cetera. Now with many other species, that's pretty much impossible. It'd be a needle in a haystack. Um, you know, there might be a billion individuals in this population, but because Kirtland's warblers are so limited in, in number and where they exist, um, that kind of thing happens pretty frequently. How old, what's the, uh, the, the life cycle of, of the bird? Like a lifespan? Yeah. Yeah, so an average bird probably only lives a year or two, um, but we've had birds, you know, 10, 10, 11, 12 years old at the oldest. So some of these birds are making, you know, 12 round trip flights from, from Michigan to the Bahamas, which is really pretty incredible for a bird that weighs about 12 grams. Um, so in very small. Um, bird. Has the uh, the technology for observing birds changed in recent years and has it gotten, is it getting better? Absolutely. Two decades ago, we, we couldn't really hardly do any of this tracking work, um, but the the tracking devices that were developed, radio tags and, and satellite tags are every year getting lighter and lighter and they're allowing us to put them on smaller and smaller birds like Kirtland's warblers so that we can begin to understand not only you know where they are during the breeding season and during the wintering season but how they get there and how long it takes and are they using wind patterns or avoiding storms and all these sorts of sorts of questions so it's been a uh, for me you know I feel like I came in at the kind of perfect time in this field when the technology was just starting to get there to really start look at these uh, really cool questions. Do, do you see them taking advantage of the wind? Yeah, so we're just starting to piece that together in Kirtland's warblers. Um, but right now it looks like that as birds get ready to leave the Bahamas, they'll sort of wait around for a few days until the, the winds are advantageous and sort of blowing to the Northwest where they're headed over to Florida and Georgia. Um, so it does seem to be pretty important. Do they get caught up in the, you know, like, like really we're getting, you know, our weather is getting more extreme. So are they able to survive? Do you see them, you know, do you, are we losing them in the kind of the turbulence? We, we don't really know on a, on a kind of individual level. Um, hurricanes are obviously, you know, there's been some, some really devastating hurricanes in the Bahamas recently. For the most part, they've happened when Kirtland's warblers were still in Michigan. And so it hasn't probably directly killed a lot of birds. And in the end, it probably helps create a lot of habitat down there. The habitat that they like depends on this regular disturbance. Um, but for other species, I'm not sure. Pete, do you have any examples of where so storms the, uh, In the Caribbean, hurricanes typically impact hummingbirds more than most other species and other species that depend on nectar because they rip out all the flowers. They get rid of you know, sources, really important sources of food for species like hummingbirds. Or, have, or species that are really specialized on particular habitats. And if those habitats just become decimated, it, it's a problem. But uh, because of the problem, you know, the question we started off with is how do you track these birds that move around? It's, it's really hard to study, you know, how birds are truly impacted by these things and by weather and by climate. And so you'd be surprised that, you know, we really don't understand much about how climate and climate change are impacting bird populations in the future. We can make predictions, but it's tough. We know that fires, you know, all the fires that we experienced out West, I'm sure the fires killed some birds individually, some species individually, but the long-term indirect impacts of how that fire influences the overall amount of habitat, habitat that's important for breeding birds, et cetera, that will probably be the impact that will have long-lasting effects rather than direct mortality on those birds. So you know, while the, the hurricanes that decimated the Bahamas were ultimately maybe good for Kirtlands, there may be other species that are negatively impacted by the loss of those habitats as well. Did they so, provide any, um, you know how they say like, like 
before there's an earthquake, you know, dogs will howl or are there, do they have predictive, you know, things that we can follow with regards to, to, you know, climate or anything? Do, is there, do they get really quiet or is there anything that you've noticed about this species? Not that we know about, unless, unless Nate hasn't told me about something yet, but, you know, for, for a lot of these species, it's, it's, there's, there's anecdotal information out there that sort of suggests that they, they arrived here just prior to a storm, or you see individual birds moving on the outskirts of a storm. And I don't have any, any um, specific things that I can point to, but I wouldn't be surprised at all if there was something going on either in barometric pressure or subtle winds or other things that birds were using as early alarm systems, things that we haven't figured out yet. And that's true for not just birds, but other animals as well. Um, navigation, you know, how do they, when you, when you watch them flying, are they flying directly from the Bahamas right to those groves of trees? And, you know, you know, I don't know how far this migration pattern is, but it's, you know, it's pretty far, you know, how do they know where they're going? It's the, it's an age old question that people have been wondering about for, uh, you know, decades and decades, if not centuries. And, you know, I won't say that we have the complete picture for any one species, but we know that they use a variety of different cues to help orient and navigate. And so it's everything from they are able to sense the magnetic fields. So they have some kind of ability to kind of have an internal compass. Some people think they can actually visualize this um, magnetic field. Others, you know, think maybe they can just kind of sense it. Um, they also use stars and, and the patterns of, of star movement to navigate. Um, smell in some cases may be important. Um, so it's, it's really a variety of different cues that they're likely using um, at any one time, but it's a, a really a fascinating topic. Do you feel like they have more intelligence than we give them credit for? That was my question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's fair to say. I, yeah. I think the, uh, they're very intelligent in their environment uh, and they can sort of move around and navigate and do what they need to do as long as they don't get screwed around with too much by humans. Mm -hmm. And so that seems to be the problem. And so um, their intelligence works for them to persist in an unaltered place. Do they, do they recognize you when you when you uh, when you come back year to year? Do you think they know you? Def definitely, I, I can't say in Kirtland's warblers. That's well, I know. I actually I will. So uh, I can share an anecdote. Um, it's been looked at in a few species that you know they can show some species can recognize individual faces, but with Kirtland's warblers, for example, um, the first year I was the one that was down in the Bahamas putting all the tags on. So I sort of you know, up close and personal interacted with each of these birds. And then fast forward a couple months when we're on the breeding season, a few of the birds, I couldn't get within a couple hundred meters of these birds. They just, every time they saw me, they took off another direction. But my interns who weren't in the Bahamas, they could walk right up to these birds, no problem. And so it really seemed like they, whether it was something about, you know, I was wearing a generally the same clothes or, whether they could truly recognize my face, I don't know. They certainly knew who I was and were responding in a negative way um, to some extent. My okay. God, he's here again. Is he following us? <laughs> yeah, on? or was it the right. stench? Um, I have to ask you both, and I, 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 don't, I don't want to derail the conversation, but I did have an experience this summer with what I think is a yellow rumped warbler. Do you know anything about those? Sure. And it was not a pleasant thing, unfortunately. Within the span of about a month, three of them died in my yard. I found them. Hmm. And I tried to do some, you know, research about this. And I mean, I couldn't really find anything. And, and I just, you know, I don't know whether, you know, we, we're living in a strange time, as we all know. I don't know whether it was, I'm not sure, but do you, do you have any insights or have you maybe related this, this you know, breed related to the Kirkland? Um, just any insights, because it was pretty upsetting, I just have to say. Yeah, and so this is something actually we look at a lot. Um, where do you live? I was in California, Santa Monica. Santa Monica, yeah. And so, uh, in fact, I could probably have a radio show, you know, call into Dr. Mara to sort of figure out what's called, what, what caused the death of your bird. Um, and where we live, there's lots of reasons why birds will die. So in your case, yellow rump warblers, also affectionately, affectionately known as a butterbutt, 
because they have a yellow um, uh, rump. Yeah. But it could be that these birds hit your windows because you know, you're know you putting up a building in a place where they typically fly in that house. And so collisions is uh, one of the major causes of bird deaths around humans. The other thing, which is the number one cause of bird death around humans is outdoor cats. And so uh, outdoor cats kill between 1.3 and 4 billion birds a year and uh, are responsible for the extinction of 63 species, 40 of which are birds around the world. Uh, and so there are lots of reasons around where you, when you find a dead bird in your yard, those are the two probably most likely causes of death. It's not necessarily because of lack of food or something else. Uh, it's probably uh, because they flew into your window or because you've got a neighbor's cat or perhaps your cat that is outdoors and shouldn't be. I see you got a dog, but yeah, outdoor oh. cats are a real problem. Yeah, I think two of them, I think you're absolutely right. Um, Cause they, they, they hit the back, my window, as you can see behind me, you know, and yeah. it looked like they just flew at it. But the other one was strange and it was in a little vegetable garden. I don't have a cat, so it's not, anyway. But it's a uh, it's upsetting, you know. It was really upsetting. So, but thank you for shedding light on that. There, yeah. there are some. Um, I think Cornell at their website has some kind of mitigation strategies for windows, and there's some special kind of like reflection covering you can put up that will make a window appear less attractive to a bird, so they won't get confused by it and fly into it. Um, and so American that's bird conservancy. When you're yeah. on those trips on um, in your uh, you know in the middle of you know you know South America, are you ever surprised by the birds that you see there? Are you ever like, wow, I can't believe this bird showed up here? All the time. That's one of the things that makes it so ex exciting is that it's when you walk out in the woods in nature, it's like opening up a treasure chest. It's like all of a sudden, you know, you pull out a if you're in the tropics, you pull out a incredible macaw or a um, uh, Ant Pitta or whatever it happens to be, you turn around and there's another jewel on a tree. You know, it's it's what's one of the most exciting things about looking at birds or studying nature. Uh, it's so unexplored, and every time you do it, it's like the first time you're doing it. Um, is is it? Are we really in our infancy of understanding what's going on in our world? You know, the we we think we know we have these elaborate taxonomies, but do we really understand our place in it and and just the elaborate uh, uh, nature of it all? I think we're totally in our infancy. It, you know, it's impressive with how much we know, but you know, as Nate described in this paper, it's one of the first times where we've been able to really track a bird from the wintering grounds to the breeding grounds, like we're doing in capturing the same individual bird. So in studying the full annual cycle, we're really reinventing this, the, we're rewriting the textbooks. Uh, and so there's so much to uncover as we start to track animals as they move around the planet. Um, and there's so much we don't understand about these species. We, you know, I was part of a study last fall where we discovered that the, there's been a decline of 3 billion birds. We lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. 57% of species uh, are declining significantly. In most of those cases, we don't know why they're declining in almost all those cases. There's so much left to discover. There's so much left to understand, let alone how do we figure out how humans can coexist in a sustainable way, given the biology of these species that have been on the planet for so long. So um, yeah, we're, we're, I, I totally think we're in our infancy in so many ways. And we just have to keep investing in science, investing in future generations, in nature and exploring nature. Um, this, is, this is all essential. Well, um, this has been incredible uh, to think of to think of birds as art, you know, and, and 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 put them into that category. I think is really important. I've never heard that before, so I really it's a beautiful thing. And hopefully, people that are watching and listening will will you know think of this differently. Nathan, I don't. Did we ask you where you're from? I don't think so. So I actually grew up in Michigan. Um, so this species is is uh, is near and dear to my heart for. A lot of reasons. My mom, um, as I mentioned, was a science teacher and when she was getting her master's degree, learned a lot about Kirtland's warblers and it was kind of right when they were about to go extinct and she became just passionate about them and, and you know, was always cutting newspaper articles about, about the species and they'd be sitting on my dresser when I came home from college and 
it just totally randomly that I ended up working with this species. And um, it was a really cool way for us to connect. And it's a, a really nice way for me to stay connected to my home area and, and get to go back to Michigan on a regular basis. So um, yeah, I really enjoy it. Pretty amazing. I know for me, when I hear certain bird sounds, it is it's so nostalgic. It may, brings me back to when I was a little kid, you know, and it just, it's weird. It can just, that sound can just catch me, you know, without, with sort of off, off guard. So anyway, yeah. thank you again um, so much for, for coming on and, and, and sharing your insights and knowledge with us. Yeah, yeah like, thanks for having us. Wonderful. Sure, our pleasure. Really appreciate it. Wow, that was fascinating. That was, you know, honestly, I, I, to, it was fascinating. And I didn't know, I mean, there's so much you don't know. And by studying one thing, I think that, but to, to think of the, the way that they sort of see, or Peter talked, Pete talked about seeing um, a bird as a work of art, you know, and to think about it and to yeah. think about the, their uh, singing as, as music too, just, it's really yeah. beautiful. So. Yeah, really, really uh, wonderful analogies, really wonderful to learn about the patterns of these birds. Quite incredible. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. I'll see you in the next one.